Hello, everyone, and welcome to the War on Palestine podcast. This is episode five, recorded and published on November 12th, 2023. I'm one of the co-hosts, Noura Erekat, joined by Ziad Aburish and Bassam Haddad. We continue to offer this podcast as a digest of news that's happening on the ground across multiple spheres. The purpose is to be a resource to alleviate the burnout and the overwhelming amount of information from multiple outlets. We want to offer this resource to consolidate and keep track of developments on the ground in Gaza and the rest of Palestine at the U- United Nations and the diplomatic front in the geostrategic sense with grassroots activism as well as the backlash to it across multiple geography and in the United States' media landscape. While the impetus for this program was the dramatic escalation of Israel's violence in the Gaza Strip, we want to emphasize, as we have individually done so elsewhere, that Israel's campaign against the Gaza Strip is not Gaza-specific. It is Palestine-specific. In the end, what is happening in Gaza Strip today is an intensification of the decades of settler colonialism and apartheid practices of the Israeli state, even if by many accounts one of its most violent iterations ever. Let us now turn to details of this most recent iteration with Ziad. We are on day 37 of the siege and bombardment of the Palestinians living in the Gaza Strip. As many of our listeners know, this latest Israeli onslaught began on October 7th in the aftermath of the Hamas operation known as Al-Aqsa Flood. Yet the current Israeli onslaught is part of the broader context of more than six different Israeli bombardment campaigns of the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip between 2005 and 2022. A 17-year Israeli-imposed blockade of the Strip, a 56-year-old belligerent military occupation of the Strip, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem, and 75 years of Israeli apartheid rule in historic Palestine after the 1948 Nakba, in which, as a result of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, both the Gaza Strip as an administrative territory and its population were constituted. However, the sheer level of destruction, displacement, and devastation of Palestinian lives in this current Israeli onslaught makes it unprecedented in many ways. According to an Israeli military spokesperson, the Israeli military has carried out more than 14,000 strikes on the Gaza Strip since October 7th, reflecting the overall level of bombardment and its continued escalation. As of November 11th, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs reports that the Israeli bombardment of the Palestinians of the Gaza Strip since October 7th has killed over 11,000 Palestinians, including more than 4,500 Palestinian children and more than 3,000 Palestinian women. In fact, 74% of all Palestinian fatalities in the Gaza Strip are children, women, and the elderly. It is worth noting that there are currently an additional 2,700 Palestinians, among them 1,500 children that are reported missing and are most likely trapped or dead under the rubble. The Israeli bombardment of the Palestinian population of the Gaza Strip since October 7th has also displaced approximately 1.6 million Palestinians, which accounts for 70% of the overall Palestinian population of the Gaza Strip. This includes the attempted ethnic cleansing of northern Gaza, where Israel's forced population transfer has reduced the population from 1.1 million to anywhere from 200 to 300,000 Palestinians. Israeli bombardment has destroyed over 10,000 buildings in the Gaza Strip since October 7th. The Israeli military struck at least 45% of all housing units in the Gaza Strip, damaging over 220,000 housing units and destroying over 41,000 housing units. Israeli bombardment has struck at least 51% of all educational facilities in the Gaza Strip. This tally includes the damage of over 279 schools and the destruction of all three universities in the Gaza Strip. Israeli bombardment and besiegement has caused the shutdown of over one half of the hospitals and nearly two-thirds of primary health care facilities across the Gaza Strip. Israel has struck over 135 medical facilities in total and damaged 53 ambulances at least. Israeli airstrikes on November 5th damaged Gaza's only psychiatric hospital, forcing the staff to discharge inpatients and halt all other services. 
In the past three days, Israeli bombardment has directly struck the Rantisi Hospital and the Anasr Children's Hospital, both in Gaza City. Israeli strikes also targeted areas adjacent to Al-Quds Hospital in Gaza City and the Al-Auda Hospital in Jabalia, both of which had previously been struck by Israeli bombardment. On Friday, November 10th, the Israeli military encircled four hospitals in northern Gaza with tanks and armored vehicles in what has come to be described as a day of war on hospitals. The hospitals were Al-Shifa, Al-Rantisi, and Al-Quds in Gaza City, along with the Indonesia hospital in Beit Lahai. The Palestinian Red Crescent Society and the international organization Doctors Without Borders have reported that the Israeli military fired live ammunition at those remaining in Al-Quds Hospital during this encirclement. While the Israeli ground incursion initiated on October 26-27 is currently focused on cutting off and further besieging northern Gaza, Israeli bombardment of the remainder of the Gaza Strip continues. Gaza remains under a full electricity blackout since 11 October, following Israel's halt of its power and fuel supply, which triggered the shutdown of Gaza's sole power plant. The entry of fuel, which is desperately needed to operate electricity generators to run life-saving equipment, remains banned by the Israeli authorities. It is worth noting that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has recently stated that Israel would maintain security control over Gaza after its war, indicating both a permanent plan for northern Gaza and potentially the entire Gaza Strip. The Israeli military has completely cut off northern Gaza, including Gaza City, Jabalia refugee camp, Beit Lahia and Beit Hanun, from the remainder of the Gaza Strip. Therein, the Israeli military has encircled both the Jabalia refugee camp and Gaza City. Israel recently announced its willingness to implement a four-hour daily pause to its aerial bombardment campaign in northern Gaza only to allow Palestinians to access so-called humanitarian corridors. Critical commentators have pointed out that anything less than 24 hours does not realistically allow the proper evacuation of civilians, while the restriction of pauses to northern Gaza demonstrates Israel's policy of forced population transfer tantamount to ethnic cleansing. Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza City is the largest medical complex and central hospital of the Gaza Strip. It has become a particularly gruesome site of Israeli airstrikes, ground operations, and siege. As of Saturday, November 11th, Al Shifa suspended operations when it lost power due to the running out of fuel. The World Health Organization said it has lost communication with its contacts at Shifa. Doctors Without Borders reported that Al Shifa has 600 inpatients, 37 premature babies, 17 ICU patients, and 600 post operative patients at the time it suspended operations. All these persons are facing elevated morbidity risks. The 37 premature babies had to be removed from incubators and now are heated by blankets alone. Two of those premature babies have died. Summarizing the situation, Physicians for Human Rights Israel claimed, quote, the picture we are now seeing at Al-Shifa is no longer of a humanitarian catastrophe. It is a collective death sentence. As of this morning, reports indicate that the Israeli military has completely besieged Al-Shifa hospital and begun shelling its compound. Also this morning, Al-Quds Hospital in Gaza City, also besieged by the Israeli military, has ceased operations after running out of fuel. Since November 7th, no bakeries have been active in northern Gaza due to the lack of fuel, water, and wheat flour, as well as the damage sustained by many. Wheat flour is reportedly no longer available in the market. Food security organizations, including the UN, have been unable to deliver assistance in the north during the past 10 days. Also in northern Gaza, neither the water desalination plant nor the Israeli water pipeline is operational. Similarly, no distribution of bottled water among IDPs accommodated in shelters has taken place for over a week. There is a serious concern about dehydration and waterborne diseases following water consumption from unsafe sources. This includes the proliferation of preventable disease like cholera. 
The Israeli siege warfare on northern Gaza is specifically meant to further encourage the area's depopulation. It is a tactic of ethnic cleansing, has featured this morning as well snipers shooting at doctors in the Al Shifa hospital. It is a campaign that is targeting individuals under the continuing distorting perverse veneer peddled by a liberal Western media that insists that this is defensive force. In the 22 days since aid has been allowed into the Gaza Strip since October 21, only 861 humanitarian aid trucks have done so via the Rafah crossing with Egypt. This constitutes less aid than the two-day average needed by the 80% of Palestinians dependent on aid for basic needs living in the Gaza Strip prior to October 7th. Recall that the majority of the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip are refugees and children. They are dependent and have been dependent on food aid for survival, increasingly so since night. Since 1993, at the beginning of the so-called Oslo peace process, when Israel began to encircle, first encircle and circumscribe the Gaza Strip, subjecting it to a campaign of de-development, isolation, and containment. Total water consumption in the Gaza Strip is currently estimated to be at 10% of the pre-October 7th levels. Speaking at the International Humanitarian Conference held on November 9th in Paris, Paris, the UN Emergency Relief Coordinator Martin Griffiths stated that, quote, the modest number of trucks we have so far managed to get in via the Rafah border crossing is wholly inadequate compared to the vast sea of needs. He went on to note, we need to get hundreds of trucks per day into Gaza, not dozens, and to be allowed to reach every place people are sheltering. According to the United Nations, water entering from Egypt in bottles and jerry cans can only address the drinking needs of about 4% of the Palestinian population of the Gaza Strip. The World Health Organization warned on November 8th of the risk of the rapid spread of infectious diseases and bacterial infections due to the water shortage and related consumption of contaminated water. The World Food Program and its partners report that some essential food items such as rice, pulses, and vegetable oil are nearly depleted in the market. Other items, including wheat flour, dairy products, eggs, and mineral water have disappeared from the shelves in shops across Gaza over the past two days. Access to bread in the south is also challenging. The only operative mill in Gaza remains unable to grind wheat due to a lack of electricity and fuel. Eleven bakeries have been hit and destroyed since October 7th. Only one of the bakeries contracted by the WFP along with eight other bakeries in the south intermittently provides bread to shelters. Since November 1, intermittent opening of the Rafah crossing between Gaza and Egypt have been limited to Israeli-approved foreign dual nationals and very few injured Palestinians, including those that are forced to evacuate the hospitals in the north who cannot access adequate care, and that doesn't include those injured who do not have the capacity to evacuate. The intermittent and limited nature of this opening cannot be overstated. For example, on both November 8th and 10th, the Rafah crossing was completely closed for the evacuation of foreign nationals, dual citizens, and injured people. And since its intermittent opening, only 131 injured Palestinians have been able to seek medical treatment in Egypt. On November 10, a spokesperson for the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs announced that the government has revised the death toll of the October 7th Hamas operation and its aftermath to about 1,200 military personnel, police, and civilians. This is down from the over 1,400 persons that the Israeli government had been reporting for the last four weeks. Israeli newspaper Haaretz has confirmed the names of 1,152 of those killed, identifying 32.5% of them as military and police personnel, and another 67.5% of them as civilians. As listeners are probably aware, Hamas and other Palestinian organizations currently hold some 239 Israeli and foreign prisoners of war and hostages, 30 of them children. This count is separate from the four hostages Hamas released without conditions and the one prisoner of war that the Israeli military claims it retrieved itself. While the taking of prisoners of war and hostages on October 7th has been a major talking point of the Israeli government, it has shown very little progress or genuine interest in the release 
or well-being of those hostages. Both the New York Times and The Guardian reported recently that the Israeli ground invasion initiated on October 26-27 torpedoed what until then was a near-done deal that would release 50 or more hostages. According to The Guardian, Hamas put an offer on the negotiation table mediated by Qatar for freeing all children, women, elderly, and sick people in exchange for a five-day ceasefire. According to the New York Times, both sides were close to finalizing the arrangement, but there was significant disagreement on timing. Hamas justified the five-day ceasefire in part due to the time needed to gather the hostages, whereas the Israeli government kept rejecting the ceasefire timeline and offered only a pause of several hours in exchange for or specifically to facilitate the release of those children, women, elderly, and sick people. The Israeli government also insisted on a detailed list of all those that would be released before the deal would be agreed to. Such conduct on the part of the Israeli government demonstrated their unrelenting attempt to make the release of any hostages or prisoners of war taken by Hamas and other groups an opportunity for intelligence gathering on the movement of members of these organizations at the expense of releasing those hostages or prisoners of war. The ultimate rejection of this deal was signaled by Netanyahu's initiating of the ground invasion on October 27. Hamas recently claimed that 57 hostages were killed as part of the Israeli airstrikes on the Gaza Strip. Inside Israel, the families of Israeli hostages have increasingly broken ways with Prime Minister Netanyahu, expressing concern at how the ground invasion and the aerial bombardment threatens their loved ones, and demanding that he do whatever it takes to bring back their relatives even if it means exchanging all of the hostages and prisoners of war for all Palestinian prisoners held by Israel, which currently exceeds 6,000. Moving to other parts of Palestine, in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, Israeli military and settler violence have killed over 168 Palestinians, injured over 2,550 Palestinians, arrested over 1,000 Palestinians, and displaced another 1,347 Palestinians through confiscating or demolishing their homes. About 59% of Israeli killings of Palestinians in the West Bank since October 7th occurred as part of search and arrest operations, primarily in Jenin and Tulkerem governorates. Some 27% occurred during demonstrations in solidarity with Gaza, and 7% were killed in settler attacks against Palestinians. Israeli military-backed settler violence in East Jerusalem and the West Bank has reached an all-time high. Since October 7th, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs has recorded 233 Jewish-Israeli settler attacks against Palestinians in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. This reflects a daily average of seven different daily instances of settler attacks. Israeli forces were either accompanying or actively supporting nearly half of all 233 Jewish-Israeli settler attacks on Palestinians in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. What limited dissent exists inside Israel to the political and military establishment's unrelenting assault on Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, not to mention elsewhere, has become increasingly precarious. 35 Jewish-Israeli and Palestinian-Israeli rights groups signed an open letter calling on the Israeli government to implement a ceasefire make a deal for all hostages and prisoners of war, and find a political solution to the conflict. The open letter also called on Israel to curb rampant settler violence and stop the persecution of Palestinian citizens of Israel and others who express solidarity with the Palestinians or oppose the Israeli assault on the Gaza Strip. In fact, the Israeli government has recently criminalized protests calling for a ceasefire, as well as the, quote, consumption of terrorist publications which includes reading or viewing social media the government labels as produced by or in support of terrorism. On November 10th, the UN Security Council convened a formal meeting called for by the United Arab Emirates. The meeting featured presentations from the directors of the World Health Organization and the Palestinian Red Crescent Society, as well as speeches by the Palestinians, Israeli, U.S., Brazilian, UAE, and other ambassadors to the United Nations. The council members appeared united in their concern about the catastrophic situation in Gaza. But while many supported a ceasefire, the United States and a minority of its allies on the council limited their proposed action to what has now become termed, quote, humanitarian pauses. This, of course, with the exception of Palestinian President Emmanuel 
Macron, who has openly called for a ceasefire in a recent interview on the BBC. Macron said, quote, I think the only solution we have is a ceasefire because it is impossible to explain we want to fight against terrorism by killing innocent people. Such a French position represents a growing concern of the French government that its previous stance of full support for the Israeli onslaught against the Palestinian people was increasingly difficult to maintain in the face of mounting domestic protests and international condemnation. Further reflecting how the U.S. position for pro Longing the Israeli assault on the Gaza Strip is increasingly an isolated one. 70 ambassadors to the UN office at Geneva issued on November 10th a joint urgent call for a ceasefire, international pressure for humanitarian access, and protection of civilians. They also emphasized the need for immediate action to address the root causes of the crisis and prevent further bloodshed. Elsewhere in the United Nations, around 50 UN staff members signed an internal U.S. letter addressed to Alice Wairumi and, and Diritu, the special advisor on the prevention of genocide in which they criticized Indiritu for our October 16th statement where she did not condemn Israel's attacks on Palestinians and their collective punishment. It is worth recalling that Indiritu's lack of commitment is a stark contrast to the November 5th joint statement by leaders of 18 UN agencies and humanitarian NGOs expressing shock and horror at the mounting death toll from the conflict and calling for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. Palestinian human rights organizations Al-Haq, Al-Mizan, and the Palestinian Center for Human Rights filed a lawsuit on November 9th with the International Criminal Court urging the body to investigate, quote, the continuous barrage of Israeli airstrikes on densely populated civilian areas, as well as the suffocating siege imposed on Gaza, the forced displacement of its population, the use of toxic gas, and the denial of necessities such as food, water, fuel, and electricity. I am a part of this effort and this filing at the ICC, a compilation and, and effort by intellectuals, activists, academics, together with these three leading human rights organizations under the banner of an ad hoc legal for Palestine. These acts, according to the filing submitted, amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity, including the crime of humanity, a crime against humanity of apartheid, including genocide. The filing specifically calls for the issuance of arrest warrants for the Israeli President Isaac Herzog, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. This follows a previous filing by Reporters Without Borders or Reporters Sans Frontier, a filing to the ICC on behalf of 34 members of their journalistic corps who were killed in Gaza during this onslaught. This particular filing that we submitted comes a day after the ICC prosecutor, Karim Khan, in a UN Security Council meeting on Libya, responded to a question about the Israeli onslaught of the Gaza Strip by asserting that a Palestine investigation is active and that he cannot comment on it as a result. Note that Karim Khan initiated an investigation of Russia within a week of its invasion of Ukraine and issued an unprecedented speed, an arrest warrant against Vladimir Putin for the forced transfer of Ukrainian children into Russia. Karim Khan did not visit the Gaza Strip or the Rafah border crossing. He never entered Gaza, but the Rafah border crossing until three weeks after the beginning of Israel's genocidal campaign, even though a group of 790 scholars had publicly post published a statement stating that what, it, what Israel is doing amounts to genocide, even though on October 19th, a UN panel of experts similarly issued a public statement in, uh, declaring that this was a genocidal campaign featuring intent and the specific underlying acts to achieve it. At the diplomatic level, French President Emmanuel Macron openly called for a ceasefire in a recent interview on the BBC. Macron said... I think the only solution we have is a ceasefire because it's impossible to explain we want to fight against terrorism by killing innocent people. Such a French position represents a growing concern at the French government that, is previous that its previous stance of full support for the Israeli onslaught against the Palestinian people was increasingly difficult to maintain in the face of mounting domestic protests and international condemnation. We will now turn to Zia to address U.S. policy. 
Meanwhile, the United States continues its full support for the Israeli war on the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. U.S. military aid to Israel, public rejection of a ceasefire, and pressure on regional allies and news outlets across the region to downplay the destruction by Israel of Palestinian life in the Gaza Strip remain the pillars of its approach to this war. The U.S. most recently took credit for Israel's agreement to a daily four-hour humanitarian pause, despite the inadequacy of this agreement to protect Palestinian civilians and its endorsement of the forced population removal from northern Gaza. The pressure facing the United States is increasing, both domestically and internationally. An October 18-19 poll conducted by Data for Progress found that 66% of U.S. voters strongly agree or somewhat agree with the statement that the U.S. should call for a ceasefire. This includes 80% of Democrat voters, 57% of Republican voters, and 56% of independents. U.S. progressive groups focused on youth voter turnout have warned U.S. President Biden that his policies of support for Israeli assault on the Gaza Strip will jeopardize the youth vote in 2024. The groups urged Biden to pressure Israel for a ceasefire, adding that failing to do so would be a moral and political disaster. Signers include the heads of groups like March for Our Lives, the student-led gun violence prevention group founded by survivors of school shootings, United We Dream, which describes itself as the largest immigrant youth-led network in the United States, Gen Z for Change, which was started during the 2020 election by online influencers as TikTok for Biden, and the Sunrise Movement, the activist youth climate organization. Also, staffers from more than two dozen Democratic offices say they are receiving an unprecedented number of calls and emails demanding for members of the U.S. Congress to support a ceasefire. They've described this as an onslaught for which their caucus was wholly unprepared. More than 100 such staffers staged a walkout on November 8th, calling on the U.S. representatives they work for to endorse the call for a ceasefire. And hundreds of protesters recently occupied the entrance to the New York Times building, reciting the names of Palestinians killed by the Israeli onslaught of the Gaza Strip since October 7th as a protest for the New York Times coverage. Elsewhere, New York City activists once again occupied and temporarily shut down Grand Central Station as they demanded an immediate ceasefire. The White House has openly claimed it is unable to control Israel's conduct in Gaza, though not once has it acknowledged the leverage of its constant supply of military equipment and diplomatic cover at the UN Security Council. In fact, both The Intercept and The New York Times have reported on the limited information the US has provided about its weapons supply to Israel, which significantly contrasts with how forthcoming the US was about such information in the case of its military support to Ukraine. Echoing the White House's support for the Israeli war on Palestinians in Gaza, U.S. government officials and school administrations have effectively launched a full frontal assault on freedom of speech, academic freedom, and the growing mobilizations critical of the Israeli war on the Palestinians and U.S. support for that war. The U.S. House of Representatives formally censured Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib for her public criticism of Israel, labeling her support for Palestinian freedom from the river to the sea as an anti-Semitic act. Brandeis University and Columbia University have officially suspended or banned their campuses' chapters of Students for Justice in Palestine. At Columbia, the suspension also targeted the student chapter of Jewish Voice for Peace. These measures followed the Florida State University system instituting a blanket ban on SJP chapters and their activities. Such repressive measures reflect the growing outrage at Israeli war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocidal acts as well as the full-throated support for the U.S. government. Thank you, Ziad and Nula. This concludes our November 12, 2023 episode of the War on Palestine podcast, a regular program of approximately 20 minutes comprising updates on what is happening on the ground in Palestine, as well as some focused analysis on how to make sense of those developments. Today's episode was hosted and produced by myself, Bassam Haddad. It was written and presented by Ziad Abulish and Noor Aliqat. 
Research for this program was conducted by Anas Al Khatib, Maisa Al Alami, Sara Al Yahya, Ranim Ayad, and Ala Atiya Mitwali. Find out more about this podcast as well as other activities that we are conducting at the Gaza and Context Collective on palestineandcontext.org. Also, please try to join us this Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time for our sixth teach-in on the social history of Gaza with uh, Abahir Al-Saqqa, moderated by Rana Barakat and myself. And also look out for a few other teach-ins, specifically on the question of knowing your rights, which has to do with various forms of protest, activism, and speaking out on campuses and beyond. (laughs) 